All right, I'm back to talk to you guys about um, drug response and things that might modify drug effectiveness and drug dosage. We, what we know is that you can give the same dose of a drug to multiple patients and they don't all respond the same way. And so we wanna try to kind of figure out some of the variables that may have play a role in that. So what, basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna run through some of these different variables, one of which is looking first at factors determining the concentration that reaches the active site, that has a lot to do with pharmacokinetics. So we'll talk about absorption, distribution, and metabolism, and excretion. Then we're going to talk about things that alter the ability of the active site to respond to the drug. And then we're going to look at some individual patient variability that may also play a role in this. So that's kind of the lay down of this whole topic. So these pharmacokinetic terms that we introduced at the beginning of the semester were absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion. So the first term here, absorption, is just simply talking about the transfer of the drug molecule from where you put it into circulating fluids, right? That's absorption. So it's getting it into the body, essentially. And that has a, there's a lot of different things that can affect this. One of the big players is how you give it the route of administration. So where you put it um, changes how it gets absorbed. So we introduce different routes of administration or in unit two, and one of which was oral administration. Then we've got some of our injectables, subcutaneous and intramuscular, IV. And of course, we know that they don't all absorb at the same rate, right? So... Um, let's look at a graph here that kind of helps to illustrate this. So we have in this graph three different routes of administration. The oral administration is, is signified by this red line here. You kind of always know when something is given orally because it's at time zero, it, there's zero percent in the blood, and then it kind of slowly climbs, and then it peaks, and then it declines. So that would be our oral. And then when we contrast that with subcutaneous, this would be putting it into the subcut, you know, a small a volume into the subcutaneous tissue via an injection. So it's going to climb up faster. You're going to absorb more of it. You're going to get more of it into the blood when you give it this way. And then it's going to sort of do the same thing. And we excrete it all about the same time. And then we have our direct entry into the bloodstream. This would be intravenous administration. So you put it right into the blood, which is why it starts at 100%, and then it kind of peters out that way. So that's just some visual in terms of different routes of administration and how they affect drug absorption. The, num the amount, pardon me, of the drug is the same in each of these examples. It's just the route is different. I guess I put that, I like that slide so much, I put it in there twice. Oh, and three times. <laughs> oh, for God's sakes. Don't know what was happening there. Um, okay, so route of administration is one of the variables. Then we got to think about, well, what's going on at the site of absorption, at, at administration? So if you're giving somebody an injection, you got to think about, well, what's, what's, what's the status of the blood flow at that site? So if they're in shock, right, or if they've got a tourniquet on and you try to administer a drug distal to the tourniquet or they're using ice or something along those lines, that's going to inhibit the circulation at the site of injection, right? So that's something. Then when we think about giving a drug orally, we got to think about the degree of ionization, right? We talked about that. Somebody's, you know, t drinking loads of Alka-Seltzer. That's going to change what's going on in their stomach, and that can change their absorption of drugs. And then there's the timing around food. We talked about this earlier, but just to re refresh our memories, if you want to a drug to absorb more rapidly, you want to give it to somebody on an empty stomach. If you want a drug to absorb more slowly, you want to give it to them after they've eaten. That will slow absorption because it slows transit time. All right, um, and we talked about this in the last video. All drugs got to get to the site by crossing a membrane. So that's going to be another thing that we want to think about. And so that 
allows us to revisit our conversation around the chemical properties of the drug. Is the drug water soluble or lipid soluble? Is it small and pretty uniform in shape or is it big and shaped really weird? Uh, what about this degree of ionization? Do we have to think about that? Um, then there's other ways that we can formulate drugs that can affect absorption. One would be you could we do things with an enteric coating so it doesn't get those drugs don't get absorbed in the stomach they get protected by this gastric pH. Also there's sustained release drugs that release the slower smaller amount of drug over a period of time. We can give um, thicker injectables, suspensions or gels and those will del delay absorption as well. So there's all sorts of things that we can do to affect the rate at which a drug is absorbed. All right, you know, and then this is all in addition to just how you dose it, the frequency of dosage, the, the, the size of the dosage and the frequency of the dosage. So now let's think about getting, so we now have got a drug absorbed into the bloodstream. Now we need to get it to ideally its target. So when you get a drug into the bloodstream, where is it gonna go? And where is it not gonna go? All right, so that is going to de be determined by the perfusion and the permeability of the area. So certain areas are harder to get to than others, right? A lot of this is kind of a no-brainer, but as you know, the blood-brain barrier is actually a barrier, and it has a, it's very difficult to pass if something is water-soluble. If it's lipid-soluble, it's a little bit easier, but there aren't a lot of spaces in the between the cells of the blood-brain barrier, right? We have glial cells that plug up the cells. The pores themselves are quite a bit smaller than you would see in a normal membrane. And there's not very much interstitial space. So this is packed. This is a barrier. The placenta is, is different. The placenta is hardly any barrier at all. It's super, super permeable, right? Which is why we caution when we have pregnant women, why we don't want them taking medications. Um, so it's really permeable, but it's not super perfused. So you can think of the perfusion as being the, the rate limiting step here, right? So you can give anesthetics into the blood to a woman during pregnancy or birth, labor and, and delivery. And because the placenta has low perfusion, the baby doesn't get that much of the anesthetic. They're going to get some, but not that much. Um, so the, the placenta is pretty permeable, so proteins, viruses, those kinds of things can cross. Um, Lipid-soluble drugs can pass very readily, and so that's one of the reasons why we'll talk about pregnancy categories in a little bit. That's one of the things that we're going to be thinking about there. And then the final thing here is, the, is um, sometimes blood... Uh, pardon me, drugs bind to non-receptor sites. And those non-receptor sites are usually some sort of protein, some sort of plasma protein. And when the drug is bound to the plasma protein, it's not free and only free drug is active drug. So this is a way that we can kind of control how the drug gets distributed. So here's a um, kind of an illustration again with my uh, incredibly advanced graphic skills at play here. So we've got your drug receptor, and then that this, of course, is supposed to be a blood vessel. And we've got our drugs bound to our plasma protein. So the drug normally would bind that receptor, but what happens is plasma proteins essentially can sequester the drug in what we would consider a non-diffusible form. So the plasma protein's holding on to that drug. It can't get, that drug can't get out of the blood while it's bound to the plasma protein. But the plasma bro protein, pardon me, can slowly release that drug. So it acts kind of like a bank or a reservoir for the drug. And then it will slowly release the plasma, the drug, pardon me, from the plasma protein as needed. And then the drug can be available to bind the receptor. So this is one of the ways that we can control the response. Um, and that's going to affect all kinds of stuff. It's going to affect onset of action, intensity of the response, duration of the response. It's not going to abs uh, affect absorption because it's already, it, it, once it's bound to the plasma protein, that means it's been absorbed, right? It's gotten into the blood. The deal with the plasma proteins tends, the plasma proteins tend to bind the drug pretty weakly. So it's not like it binds it and holds it forever, doesn't let it go. It tends to bind it pretty weakly and therefore it can release it readily. Um, when drugs are highly plasma protein bound, which means they have a high affinity to, for plasma protein, 
then and that word affinity i can't remember if we've used yet but affinity means like it's like an attractiveness if you will so a drug with a high affinity for a plasma protein is very likely to bind the plasma protein even if the concentration of the drug is not that great so when we have a scenario where we have drugs that have a high affinity for plasma proteins a good example of these kinds of drugs would be like anticoagulants for example they're known to be pl highly plasma protein bound so sometimes what happens is we have to give to account for this the first dose we sometimes call a loading dose or a priming dose and that allows for the larger dose of the drug to load onto the plasma proteins and then from that point forward we just need to give a little bit of drug smaller maintenance doses because of the fact that a fair amount of this drug is bound up and um, being sequestered by the plasma proteins um Another different concept in this distribution conversation is sometimes drugs distribute to other storage sites, other places other than the plasma protein where they can get stored. Some of the known storage depots for drugs are one fat, especially for fat soluble drugs. They love to get stuffed into the fat, which makes it takes them out of circulation, which makes them less likely to hit their receptor and produce their response. Muscle is another distribution site. The liver is a distribution site. The kidneys can be a distribution site. And the bone can be a distribution site. So if a drug distributes from, from the bloodstream to all kinds of other sites other than where you want it to go, we refer to that as the volume of distribution of the drug. And in many cases, that requires more drug. You have to give more to allow for it to get into these different areas and also then get to the receptor. Once the drug does redistribute to uh, someplace like the fat, there is a chance that it can get ta taken, released from that site and put back into general circulation. And that can be an issue. Um, perfusion sort of is a, is a player with that. So this is kind of complicated and I don't want it to be, I don't want to spend a lot of time thinking about this because it's not really, it's sort of outside of the scope of our class. But it brings us to this volume of distribution, which is oftentimes um, illustrated with, with a V, and actually this should be a, a lower subscript there, VD. So um, the volume of distribution. So these are our volumes of our different comp fluid compartments, right? So we have three liters of plasma, we have 16 liters of plasma plus interstitial fluid, if you throw in the intracellular extra and all the extracellular fluids are about 40. And the storage depots, fat, liver, muscle, etc., all are greater than 40 liters of fluid as well. So there's a so it's a, you know, it's a bit this is a big and tricky topic. Of course, most of the time we're not going to be dealing with this in sort of a routine setting. One field that does have to deal with this a lot is um, people who do anesthesia. So like if you're going to, you're on track to be an anesthesiologist or an, even a nurse anesthesiologist, nurse anesthetist, I guess is the more appropriate term, um, which is a great profession, by the way. Uh, you have to kind of know a lot about this because you're giving drug and that you're trying to have an effect but yet if it has a heart live high volume of distribution you have to know that it's going to move all over the place and it makes it pretty tricky and so this is something that you would pay a, quite a bit of attention to at that point so the volume of distribution is really just a hypothetical volume of fluid into which the drug is disseminated. Drugs that are very water soluble tend to have a low volume of distribution which should make sense because they get kind of trapped in the blood and they have a high blood concentration. Drugs that are very lipid soluble tend to have a large volume of distribution, which means they're gonna cross membranes readily and they're gonna to go to some of those depots, especially fat is a very good uh, place, places where you have a lot of fat, so the central nervous system where we got a lot of myelin as well. Um, you've got a large volume of distribution and a low blood concentration, which means the blood doesn't stay, the, pardon me, the drug doesn't stay in the blood, instead it distributes to some of these other depots. So that's something to think about. All right, so we've talked about distribution, we've talked about relative perfusion and permeability, and we talked briefly about the blood-brain barrier and the placental barrier. We talked about binding to non-protein, non-receptor sites like plasma proteins, and we talked about some other storage sites.
then we kind of have to think about a couple other things, body weight, and this has a lot to do with fat, um, dose per kilogram per weight. People that have a higher fat content, like women versus men, tend to distribute drugs more readily. Um, sex also has uh, plays a role. Again, it has more to do with body size and fat as well. All right, so let's talk about metabolism. This is a little more straightforward. Most drugs are metabolized or biotransformed in the liver. So um, there's other places where this happens, but the liver is the big site. In most cases, the drug gets changed from a, a more active to a less active chemical. Sometimes drugs can get activated. I don't know what's going on with the hiccups with me today. Sometimes drugs can get activated in the liver as well. Um, uh, also, one of the things that we, we can do is ionize those drugs so we can eliminate them more readily. That has a lot to do with the kidneys. Um, let's talk a little bit more about the liver. In the liver, you've got a lot of enzymes, as you probably know, but there's a very important family of enzymes called the cytochrome P450 system, the cytochrome P450 family of enzymes. And these guys are important. So essentially what happens if you have a drug that induces the cytochrome P450 family of enzymes, what that means is it's going to increase the metabolism. So these are, these are enzymes in the liver that metabolize drugs, this family of enzymes. And if you induce the cytochrome P450 system, that means it's going to increase the rate of metabolism of that drug and any other drug that's also metabolized by the cytochrome P450 system, which is almost all of them. So it, it increases the rate of metabolism. If you inhibit, if a drug inhibits the cytochrome P450 system, then what that does is it decreases the rate of metabolism of that drug and any other drug that's also metabolized by the cytochrome P450 system. Um, okay, I don't, the binding isn't really that important. I'm not going to test you on that. Competitive binding really isn't a significant, clinically significant situation in this situation. Sometimes we do get covalent binding of drugs to an enzyme, and which causes a permanent change in the um, enzyme action. And most of the time, it is um, going to be relating to inhibiting those enzymes, which means that you're going to decrease the rate of metabolism of those drugs. So there's all kinds of cytochrome P450 enzymes. They are all going to be identified with a CYP, and then you throw in the 1A2, 2C9, etc. So these drugs participate in the metabolism of most of our, pardon me, these enzymes participate in the metabolism of most of our drugs. You can see down there that the cytochrome P3A4, that particular cytochrome enzyme metabolizes 50% of prescribed medication. So that's half. So if you induce cytochrome P4, P, pardon me, cytochrome 3A4, then you're going to increase the rate of all metabolism of, of large numbers of drugs if someone's taking more than one drug. So that's something to think about. Um, the FDA is pushing for kind of testing these drugs against these enzymes before we start giving them. All right, so let's think about spe special patient considerations. And, you know, this could be a much longer conversation, but I'm just going to kind of like, let's just sort of think you through this. So on your exam, you'll have a couple questions that sort of give you a clinical scenario, and you're going to have to sort of be able to critically think through it. So these are things that are going to potentially affect metabolism that, are, that have to do with what's going on in the patient. So one would be their pathology. Do they have liver disease, right? Someone with liver disease, you're going to expect their ability to metabolize drugs to be inhibited. People who have renal disease, you're going to expect their, their ability to excrete drugs to be inhibited. People who have cardiovascular disease, you're going to expect their ability to perfuse their tissues to potentially be compromised. People that are very young and people that are very old tend to have um, aberrant enzyme systems. Um, it, people are very young oftentimes don't have all the enzymes they need ready, readily available. People who are very old tend to have oftentimes lots of comorbidities. They tend to have cardiovascular disease. They might have some other pathology. 
and they might also have some enzymatic dysfunction. People can have genetic inherited er errors of metabolism, which oftentimes we know about, at least pretty quickly. Um, they might be on other medications that are, uh, that are causing alterations in their cytochrome P450 families. So they might, we might see a, um, you know, inducing or an inactivation that way. Then we got to think about things that are non-prescribed, like alcohol and tobacco, both induce cytochrome P450. So that changes the way they metabolize drugs. Um, and then there's this kind of interesting phenomenon called tolerance, which we're going to talk more about in unit six. But metabolic tolerance, um, what we see, with, that's basically some sort of metabolic change that requires us to have to administer more drug in order to uh, have the same, for the drug to have the same effects. So we don't know for sure, but with a metabolic tolerance, there's some sort of a uh, so some sort of a biochemical alteration um, and therefore it's changing the way they metabolize drugs and with tolerance we know with any drug that exhibits tolerance you have to continue to increase the dose in order to maintain the effect so that tells us that they're eliminating drug too quickly or it's not getting to the active site that kind of a thing so that's something to also think about <laughs> so here's one of my cartoons he was depressed on the antidepressants because his Vioxx and Celebrex were giving him chest pain, so he took an Aleve for that, but it caused heart problems, so now he's having a double martini. <laughs> so this kind of, it's funny, but it illustrates a pretty important point, which is that lots of people are on more than one medication, and so there's a lot of these kinds of things that we have to think about in terms of alterations to metabolism. All right, so let's look at excretion. So we know that the kidney is the major site of excretion, but we also have the liver as a site of excretion, which helps us to excrete um, toxic substances for basically into the feces. There is the potential for recirculation in this kind of a setup. We also can excrete drugs through our sweat glands. We excrete drugs through our saliva. We excrete drugs through our lungs. Mom, mother's milk can trap alkaline drugs. We've talked about that already. Um, so excretion rate is important. We, when we're administering drugs habitually in a chronic kind of a setting, we need to make sure that they're able to excrete the drugs, you know, as we're administering, because what we don't want to have happen is the drug concentration to continue to escalate to potentially a toxic level in the blood. So the excretion rate is really important. Um, when we think about the kidney as being our primary site of excretion, we need to think about how we get the drugs in there. One is what's going on with blood flow to the kidney, and that has to do with glomerular filtration rate. Um, we will filter things that are small. We'll filter things that are not protein bound. Most drugs are going to be eliminated via an uh, via a secretory process, which means being actively pumped from the blood into the renal tubules at a site other than the glomerulus. And so that has a lot to do with the drug. It also has to do with the mechanisms of active, tr active transport. And this is one of the th reasons why drugs can be tricky for old people and young people because their active transport mechanisms oftentimes are not up to snuff. And then we have the ability also to reabsorb drugs potentially from the kidneys. And that has a lot to do with what we were talking about before with the degree of ionization. So it depends on what's going on, what's the drug, what's the, what's the pH of the, of the, in this case, the filtrate. Is the drug fat soluble or water soluble? What's the size, the shape? You know, it's just a membrane, right? We're just talking about getting it across a membrane. So these are all things to think about. Here's a, a picture that I kind of like because it shows us a couple of different things here. It shows us this would be the glomerulus, right? So drugs that have low molecular weight, they're small and they're not protein bound. Proteins are too big to get through there. So those would small and non-protein bound substances can get filtered. Lipid soluble drugs, once they get in here, can get reabsorbed. Non-lipid soluble drugs tend to stay in here. Then we have the ability to actively transport, secrete drugs from the blood into the filtrate that way. So that's just our, some of our main
uh, opportunities for transporting a drug into and out of the renal tubule. So that brings us to this concept of clearance. Clearance is a calculated volume and it is generally given in the measurements of milliliters per minute or liters per hour. And so basically clearance is telling us, so when we think about clearance, we have to think about a volume of fluid that would be completely cleared of a drug in one minute if all were removed from that volume and none was removed from the remaining fluid in the body. That's a very confusing definition. So let me say it again. A volume of fluid that would be completely cleared of a drug in one minute if all were removed from that volume and none was removed from rem the remaining fluid in the body. So essentially what this is doing is it's compensating for plasma concentration. Physiologists and clinicians refer to clearance in the terms of re renal clearance. So essentially what renal clearance is all about is about the ability to clear a volume of drug from a volume of fluid in, that we would expect to be moving into the kidneys. And the way we calculate clearance, estimate clearance, the ability to clear through the kidneys, is done by a test called creatinine clearance. So research pharmacologists refer to this as total drug clearance. It includes the metabolism and excretion of all possible routes, but that's not really very applicable in a clinical setting. Instead, in a clinical setting, we refer to this as renal clearance. Again, I don't want you to get too hung up on this. It's just something you may or may not here and 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 where the, sort of the the utility of this conversation would be if if somebody's creatinine clearance is altered, right? Their clearance is up or their clearance is down. You would expect them to be if they if they were clearing things through the kidney too quickly, you would expect them to be losing drug faster. If their clearance was down, you would expect them to be retaining drug in the body, and that's really where I think it's it's most useful. So we're going to be looking at our patients with kidney disease in this context for the most part. All right, so to kind of summarize, the intensity of a response to a drug at a given dose of a drug. So these are the things that we want to think about. The concentration of the drug at the active site, and that has to do with pharmacokinetics, which is absorption, metabolism, excretion, and elimination. Uh, I should say absorption, distribution, metabolism, excretion, and elimination. Then we need to think about the ability of the active site to actually respond. And sometimes we have to think about physiologic state of our patients in these cases. Then we have to think potentially of the pathologic state of our patients in these cases. Then we need to think about tolerance. Tolerance is again where you have to increase the dose of the drug to maintain the reset, the, res, res, um, the response, right? So this is receptor or metabolic clearance or tolerance, pardon me. And this is a phenomenon that we're going to talk more about in unit six, but um, probably what's happening, we don't really know for sure what's happening with tolerance. One of the, I think, things that makes the most sense is an actual change in receptor density. So receptor density changes and therefore there's less or more receptors available to hit the, to be bound by the drug. Um, there's also probably a possibility that we can have a change in the response to the receptor being hit, and that might alter the second messenger system. Um, that also probably leads to dependence on the drug, which we're gonna talk more about later on. And then again, we kind of have to summarize in looking at our patient, the patient, patient to patient. What's their age? What's their going on? Are their enzymes maybe getting tired? What's going on with their blood-brain barrier? What's going on with their circulation? What about their weight? Do they have a fair amount of surface area and a lot of fat? Um, size, body composition, pregnancy, and nursing. All of these things are things to consider when we're thinking about drug therapy. This right here is the category for pregnancy, drug categories for pregnancy. So you'll see preg drugs being listed as being pregnancy category A, B, C, D, or X. A means there's been actual human trials on this drug and shown no risk. Um, on, I should say on pregnant humans and shown no risk. 
Then they have pregnancy category B saying um, there maybe saw some risk in animals, but they had limited human trials and didn't see any risk in the humans. But they don't really, basically, they don't really have a lot of data. Pregnancy category number C says that we saw, we gave this drug to pregnant animals and it showed some damage, but we did not give it to any humans. So that would be C. Pregnancy category number D would be evidence of human fetal risk. So you only want to give this drug if it's a life-threatening condition and you have not any other options whatsoever. And pregnancy category number, category X is completely contraindicated. There is absolutely no possible benefit um, for the risk that the fetus, that you're taking with a fetus. So kind of the general rule of thumb, I think I have another one of these here. Um, the general rule of thumb is if you're going to give a drug to a pregnant woman, make sure it's category A. That would be the most ideal. Well, the general rule of thumb is if you can not give a drug to a pregnant woman, woman don't. Avoid drugs as much as possible, if that's a possibility. If that's not a possibility, then you're pretty, you're, you feel pretty confident with A, with B, it's getting a little shaky, and anything sh anything short of B, you have to have, you know, C, you have to have C or D. X, you're not going to give under any circumstance ever to a pregnant woman. C or D, you have to have pretty compelling reasons to do it, right? A or A's, you feel okay. B is even, in my opinion, a little a little on the on the shaky side, just because we don't really know, right? We don't really know. We t I talked in the drug legislation bit about the thalidomide, you know, we don't really know what's going on with these things. DES and all of that has happened. So um, we, it'd be nice to have the data in he pregnant humans prior to giving them these drugs. All right. Um, <clears throat> and then there's other things to take into consideration as well. This sort of goes on and on, but, you know, the environment is something else to think about. That has to do with this is having to do with like temperature affecting circulation and altitude affecting, um, you know, blood uh, uh, delivery and delivery, you know, et cetera. Um, and then there's psychosocial things that we have to consider as well. Um, there's the whole placebo thing, which is fascinating, right? I just love the whole placebo effect. And then, you know, and then it kind of comes down to, it, <laughs> in all honesty, one of the most important variables is this one right down here. And it's just, if you want a drug to work in a patient, is your patient going to take it, right? What's the compliance? Compliance is a, it seems like it wouldn't be that big of a deal, but it is a big barrier to success with drug therapy. Um, if the drug is easy to use, they're going to be much more likely to take it. Um, if, you know, it's not all that expensive, they're going to be much more likely to take it. Where, where, cost become, where the cost kind of factors in here is, remember when we looked at um, our repetitive dosing and dosing on the half-life and trying to uh, get, reach a steady state, which is where you want to be if somebody's on drugs chronically. Um, when you get to, a, when you're in a situation where the drug is very expensive, sometimes they won't take it as frequently, which means that they could stay below that minimum effective concentration, so they're just wasting their money, right? And then it just comes right down to the patient. Can you, is the patient responsible enough to actually do what they need to do in terms of this therapy? So these are all things that we need to think about all of the time. Um, I think this is just a sort of a summary of all those things that we talked about. And then there's genetics. That just throws a whole other wrench in it, right? And this is sort of the, the big unknown. We're learning more about it. Polymorphisms, polymorphisms are genetic, um, basically like mutations. There's some that we know about, some that we don't know about. Um, uh, these are some that we do know about. Um, this is an enzyme called acetyltransferase, which seems to be a high show up uh, with a relatively high degree of penetrance in Scandinavians, Jews, North Africans, North African, Caucasians, um, and uh, and that tends to slow this process of um, acetylation down, acetylation, and Japanese people tend to acetylate faster. So these are drugs that use this pathway. Don't memorize any of these. But then there's some other examples as well. So genetics is a whole nother deal, right? Um, and we don't know. We don't know a lot about this, right? So you hear some examples of some 
potentials. People who have sulfa sensitivities, oftentimes it's because they can't metabolize the drug. That would there's a genet that's a genetic polymorphism, most likely. Um, we've got receptor defective receptors in our in our type two diabetics. We don't know why that is. That is a big question. All right, so I think one of the things we want to think about is always is if we have the opportunity to, to get the pre-drug status of individuals, get a baseline state before we start giving drugs, and then we'll have a better idea of knowing whether or not some of these things are happening. Um, okay, that's a summary of all the things that we talked about in this video, which I think was longer than a half an hour, and I'm sorry for that. Um, so I'm going to leave you with a couple thought questions here. What sorts of things determine onset of a drug's action, the peak where it tops off, and duration of action? So we've been going over those, but this is just another way to think about it. So give that some thought, and we'll come back with the final video in this unit, which is to look at adverse responses to drugs and consequences of some of these drug reactions. I'll see you in a little